but because it was genuinely unique, you know, unlike the Galaxy, or unlike my Galaxy S, which I considered was just a complete knockoff of the iPhone, you know, Microsoft brought something fresh to the table, and it just it fascinated me. Um, I was a huge fan of the emphasis that was placed on typography, and how the interface was primarily comprised of, uh, you know, content. And you know, unlike the other OSs, it didn't try to mimic something that it, that it wasn't. And so you didn't find any gradients or, or, or drop shadows or, or brushed metal or wood grain. You know, none, none of this was in sight. And there was also these you know, beautiful, fluid, um, very meaningful animations that would, come to, would bring the OS to life when you would interact with it. And it just felt very responsive, very snappy, and, and it, was fast, it felt faster than everything else. The one thing, though, that really sold me was the, the emphasis that was placed on gestures. And so there was this interaction of the panorama control and the pivot control, which just you know, had content bleeding off the edge and enticing you to, to swipe across to get more information. Now, to me, this felt like the perfect way that we should be interacting with a glass flat surface. And you, know, you contrast this to the constant button prodding and, and page drilling that we need to do to navigate iOS or Android. And you know, this is another thing that sort of um, opened up my eyes a little. And what I realized at this point was you know, Microsoft were going on a very new and interesting direction. You know, they delivered real innovation to the smartphone experience, and it's something that hadn't been done since the first generation iPhone, in my personal opinion. I mean, not even, not even Apple themselves. I mean, we look at iOS 6 today, and it's, it's, it's very similar to previous iterations. And um, so Mike and I, we, we believe that Microsoft were onto something, and uh, we really just wanted to be a part of it. The decision to adopt Windows Phone 7 was made quite a lot easier when we actually figured out that it was um, apps were built in Silverlight, and Mike and I actually had a a solid background developing WPF software, and so we were very familiar with XAML and C Sharp and all the tools that were, um, you know, very familiar, very familiar to us. And you know, within a, within a few days after after grabbing this phone, we thought, yep, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go all in, and we started uh, Lazy One Maps. So all we did now were, was an app. We had our, our fair share of um, a random ideas, everything from you know the stupid puzzle game to the cliche to do list app. But you know, to be honest, we didn't really care too much because we just wanted something to test the waters. Uh, a Windows Phone Hello World, if you will. And being a heavy YouTube user and having an Android and iPhone uh, before that, you know, I knew what a YouTube experience should be like on, on a smartphone. And when I spotted the native YouTube experience on the app, uh, you know, it was, the app was just a, a shortcut to n.youtube.com. And you know, I felt that this was a great opportunity, a great entry point for us. And so I thought we'd tackle this space. Uh, I should also note that the, um, the IE browser at the time, it didn't support HTML5 and it didn't support Flash. And so, you know, the YouTube experience was, was horrendous in, in, my, in my point of view. So, you know, that's what we did. We, we knocked together this very basic uh, first cut. Um, within two weeks, actually, we had something live on the marketplace. And the app had a basic uh, pivot control layout, and we would fire you off to IE for the actual playback. And you know, it was nothing more than, than, than a proof of concept. It was, it was a bit of a hack, and, and it was rushed. But you know, the design wasn't half bad, and um, it was miles ahead of, of the web version. So it turned out that pretty much everyone else wanted a better YouTube experience. And uh, the media soon caught on, and we started seeing reviews um, and posts uh, come up about the app. And you know, we were the only actual YouTube app on the marketplace, and so we were, we were killing it. And I should probably put a little bit of context you know, um, around the phrase. The Windows Phone 7 ecosystem was probably about I don't know, 14 people at the time. And so you know, Mike and I weren't going to be going to the Porsche dealership anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, but you know, it was a start. And having achieved our initial goal of publishing an app to the marketplace, uh, we started assessing you know, what's going to be our next move? What are we going to do next? And from our experience working in consumer software, we knew that you needed hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users, before um, a freemium model actually translated into anything that was worthwhile. So you know, we were here sitting at the top of the marketplace, and you know, we were ranking extremely high. And so we had a very good idea about the numbers at the time, and, and it just didn't make sense. And so we said that we'll set out to have a primary goal of getting exposure for ourselves. And we'd worry about monetizing later when the numbers started to make sense. So we didn't actually bother with a paid app. Um, we knew that the second you, uh, even, even with a free trial, the second you put a price tag on your app, you can expect about a tenth of the downloads. And so we felt that the best way forward was, would be to focus on, on a free app. We 
we anticipated actually that Google would eventually launch an official YouTube app, and so you know they'd gate crash on our party, and um, we knew that that exposure alone wasn't going to be enough. So we needed to gain fans, right? Um, we figured if we deliver a, an awesome and amazing experience, uh, people would know the quality of our products, they would know what we're about, and uh, in the event that we could no longer leverage YouTube, um, people would look forward to something else that we'd launch. So we had uh, two very, very distinctive, very clear goals. We set out to d deliver the best possible YouTube experience that we could, and we'd try and get our brand in front of as many people as possible. So we actually got off to a flying start. N not only did we already have the technical knowledge uh, to develop these kind of apps, but we, our, our experience with consumer software, we knew how to deliver consumer software. So what do I mean by that? Um, for starters, uh, we knew the importance of setting up a website that showcased our work. And you know, app websites don't actually get that many hits because most of it's discovered through within the marketplace. But not having a website really uh, allows people to question your credibility. And we knew the importance of social media, so we set up um, Facebook and Twitter, um, a YouTube channel, and also we, we knew the importance of customer service, and so we had an info and a support email address that people could reach out to us on. And you know, just setting up these email addresses wasn't going to be enough. We knew that we had to reply to every single email, and you know, those who do customer support know how difficult and tedious this can be, um, but it's very important to show that we care. We knew the importance of engaging uh, our customers and sort of keeping them up to date. And so we constantly um, converse with them and, and communicate with them and really uh, listen to them and, and take their uh, suggestions on board. And it sort of gave them a sense of ownership uh, of, uh, and loyalty to our product. And finally, you know, we, we knew the importance of recruiting beta testers and so to ensure the quality of our updates. And you know, this stuff is all very trivial. It sounds very trivial. And um, for the most part, it is. But not many people were doing this at the time. And it gave, it gave us uh, a real edge. So we, we'd proven that there was a market for third-party YouTube apps. And others started to take notice. And it wasn't much longer before other people have started to take, have a go. Uh, we'd, we'd, we had to, throughout our journey, we've had to fend off everything from you know, the casual hobbyist right through to corporate giants like HTC, who, who also released a YouTube app. And, and actually, they pretty much bundled it with their devices. And so the kind of fight that we had to put up, the kind of fight that we had to put up was, was, was pretty immense. And here's a few things that I believe have helped us stay on top. As I explained uh, before, we put a great deal of emphasis into passive, passively and actively listening to our uh, customers and engaging them in conversations. So what I mean by passively listening is uh, we give out as many uh, avenues as possible for people to communicate with us. And when they do communicate, we respond to them. And uh, what I mean by actively listening is we go out of our way to, to check you know, as many sources as possible, as many avenues as possible to see what people are saying about our products and services. And you know, to give you a little bit of better idea about what I'm saying here is and this is a routine that we sort of do on a daily basis. So we fire up uh, ZTOP or App Tracker, and we read through all of the latest marketplace reviews. Uh, these apps actually display uh, reviews from all around the world, and they have a translate feature, which comes in handy. And um, we also read reviews of our, of our competitors so that we know, you know how we stack up and, and what their users are facing. The next thing is we jump on Twitter, and so we've got a whole range of, of search columns that span all sorts of different keywords that relate to our, uh, our products and, uh, and the space that we're in. And um, we, we, we do similar keyword searches on, on Google Search, and the key thing here is that we actually filter it by day or week, and so that we don't miss any of the latest stuff that's being said about us or any of the latest articles that are being posted. Another strategy that we use is in-app communication. And so every time our app crashes or, or has an issue, we pop a dialog box in and encourage people to reach out to us so that we can try and resolve their issues. The most important thing about active communication is that we, not, we don't just listen, but we engage in the conversation. And so we reply to every crash report. Uh, we often tweet back to people who are talking about our service. And we regularly engage uh, in articles and forum threads. So the thing is, this doesn't just serve as a learning experience for us. But you know, people, they don't expect to hear from us in these kind of situations. And they're often taken aback when we reach out to them. And so here's a user who was having an issue with, uh, with MetroTube. And it was actually so bad for him that he'd actually uninstalled it. And notice here, there's no mentions or anything. So this actually came up in one of our keyword uh, searches. And so 
reaching out to him, we wouldn't just manage to solve his problem, but he seems to have a newfound respect for, for our company. This level, of this level of communication does a few things. Uh, we gain a much better understanding of the market, and um, it helps us uh, sort of steer our app in the right direction. We're able to pinpoint bugs and usable issues very quickly. It helps us, like, like we just saw before, it, um, it helps us convert users, uh, sorry, it helps us convert our customers from users to fans who are you know, far more likely to, to be accepting of our shortcomings and uh, are willing to, and are willing to um, uh, promote our products and, and, and talk about our products. And, and it also gives us a pretty good idea about what, what our direct competitors are doing and what their users are facing, so it allows us to adapt and react. Uh, on the topic of listening, it's uh, very important that you have to have very, very thick skin. Uh, there's uh, so many trolls and keyword warriors out there, and they'll blow issues out of proportion. And so I think the key is you know, we learn from it what we can, um, but we, we can't take it to heart. And lashing out, it, it doesn't get you anywhere. And the amount of one-star reviews that we've had for just the most ridiculous reasons is, uh, is really frustrating, but I think this is something that we've spotted you know, across the board. So here's one of my uh, all-time favorite reviews that I'd like to share with you guys. Are you thinking in me? I can't think sign it. And I have is it playing? It's not audio? Thank you, sir. You may be heard. What is stopping me from going to YouTube on Explorer and signing in Far 3? You don't have to make people pay for using a YouTube blueprint. The reason I wanted a YouTube that is so that I can sign in and watch videos quickly and without loading five pages before I get to what I want. That is so annoying on so many levels. Why is everything on Windows phone so expensive? This phone could actually compete with an iPhone if it wasn't for people like you lazy face word. <laughs> So, I mean, you know, we, we, just, we just introduced a paid app and, you know, we had this little dialog box from within our free app promoting, uh, you know, promoting the, the paid app and, and this, you know, this guy didn't seem to like it too much. And um, the sad thing is, you know, the paid app was 99 cents. For those who have been on the marketplace, they know that's the minimum you can actually charge. It had a free trial and uh, we didn't even restrict the trial and so literally it was a donation, like you didn't even have to pay anything. And so this is what I'm trying to get across is, you know, don't take things to heart because people are crazy. <laughs> um, so back on topic, basically what, what I'm trying to say is, you know, we try and keep our fingers on the pulse and we really try to understand the problem space. You know, what are people facing? What are the real core issues that, that, our, that our products are facing? And you know, it helps us come up with solutions that are really effective and as relevant and relevant as possible. The marketplace game. Uh, there's only two things that matter on the marketplace. It's your your rating and your ranking. So the higher you rank, the more likely you're going to be seen on the marketplace. And the higher your star rating, the more likely people are going to click through and read what you're about and eventually install your apps. I spoke about how our primary goal was to get exposure and you know making a name for ourselves. I also just mentioned that we'd actually introduced a paid app, but the truth is uh, this paid app was nothing to do with making money. And, um, you know, let, let, let me explain this a little bit further. You know, the heart of the marketplace navigation is via this category list. And when you select one of these categories, you put into this pivot control. Now, the first thing that a user sees is the top paid apps. And if we look to the second section, it's the free apps. And you notice how there's a, a lot of massive big name companies in that section. So, uh, the, and the final thing is the the top, only the top six are actually visible before you have to scroll down. So you really want to try and stay in, this, in the top six. So our free app started to plummet in the rankings. You know, the more and more of these big name apps started to, to creep in and we just started to edge below and we needed to do something about it. And so we did, we did the following things. We set up uh, a paid app with a few extra features and you know, nothing major, just to give people uh, a reason to try it. And we made the decision really, really easy. Like I said, we had a free trial and we didn't restrict that trial. So we put the, the uh, we tried to make it really simple for them and, and they didn't have to think about the decision. And then we drove traffic from our free app. So all the traffic that we'd amassed in our free app, we drove it straight into our paid app. And this isn't the best financial decision, of course, 
but it helped us shoot right to the top of the paid um, of the paid category. And this is basically the, the, the best possible exposure that you can get from within the marketplace, short of being featured. And you know, one thing to note is once you enter into that top six, it's much easier to stay there because you know you're getting more and more exposure and you're getting more and more clicks. Um, think of it like you know search engine optimization or SEO. Once you know if you if your links are at the, on the first page, you're going to get exponentially more clicks than the second or third, etc. And so if you fight hard to get into the top six, life gets a lot easier. During our time in the marketplace, we've noticed a few things. Um, don't quote me here because I, I can't I can't be certain, but we believe that the Windows Phone marketplace ranking system is based on downloads within a two to three week cycle. Now the key thing to note here is, is downloads don't actually have to be unique. So basically what I'm saying is every update that you release is going to boost your rankings. And so you know the more frequently you update, uh, the higher you're going to rank. Uh, we release updates as, as often as we possibly can. So having said that though, it's very important that you don't lose your user's trust. You know, there's no point in pushing out an update if you know they're not going to download it, uh, and even worse if they start getting all these uh, "quote unquote" bug fix updates, and, and they might get annoyed and they might uninstall your app. So we always we always aim to include features within our, within every update, and the more visual the update is, the better. We found that you know most people don't actually read the change logs, and so unless they see a change in the UI, they're going to feel that that update was was a waste of time. Now I'm not saying that you have to completely redesign your app for every single update, but just even subtle UI changes makes makes all the difference. And even, of course, you know you can't always change the UI, and sometimes you won't have to, but you should always keep it in mind. So several small incremental updates does wonders for your rankings. And on top of this, you, if, if users are seeing the app progressing and improving, they're going to probably change their rating from a low rating to a high rating, or they'll be more likely to rate your app better. And so it's it's a it's a win-win. You you got you're boosting your rankings and you're boosting your ratings. And we've been fortunate enough to have been covered in the media, and so with with every substantial update, you know this gives us the excuse to send out press kits. And uh, we found that you know everyone that's covered us before generally covers us again with with these major with major updates. And so I think the major the major message here is update your apps. You know that's the that's the single most effective thing that you can do. For those who are familiar with our apps and the apps of our competitors, we'll know that we actually usually uh, have a smaller feature set, and we still, however, manage to hold higher rank. And we found that most people choose experience over functionality. And so, of course, I mean, this is all within reason. You have to fulfill a certain level of functionality. But the more effort that you put into design, the better chance that you're going to have to compete. So rather than trying to match our competitors' feature set, we focus on delivering the better experience. And you know, as I explained in our initial goals, we've had this model from the very beginning. And um, just an example to showcase this is a, a 2.0 update that we pushed out. Now, 2.0. Uh, it saw the inclusion of a custom video player, which no longer piggybacked off IE, and so we had a, a full, full blown player within our app. And we also implemented YouTube's like and dislike feature. Now, both of these were major features on their own. We could have pushed these, we could have pushed these features out without thinking too much, and it would have been a big update. But I ended up actually putting a lot of thought uh, into the like the design of the of the rating toggle itself. And so I was trying, if you look from the sketches, I was thinking about how do I best mimic the action of thumbs up and thumbs down. And I was just trying to give people a, a unique kind of experience. And the playback player as well, we, we actually get it, got it to play inside thumbnail view. So here you can see in the little uh, video is actually playing. And to get it to full screen, you just have to rotate your phone. And the thing is this, you know, Mike's had a whole heap of trouble with performance to try and actually technically to get this to work. Um, but we stuck at it and we made it work. So what I'm saying is we put, we put most of our effort into innovating on the actual experience rather than trying to deliver a, a particular feature set. And I think this is probably the, one of the biggest things that's really helped us uh, stand out from the crowd. The next major milestone for us came with the announcement of Windows Phone Mango. Uh, Joe Belfiore did what he does best, and he jumped up on stage and he got us very, very excited about the, uh, this, this new update. And so we thought that we'd take advantage of it and, and release, and time a release, a major release of our app uh, with the new OS. The thing is, our app was 
was pretty much feature complete, and I knew that to justify a rollover of a, you know, a 3.0 version number, uh, we needed to redesign the app. It was the only way that it was really gonna, um, gonna work. And so that's what I set out to do, and the single best resource for me came in the form of a design template that Microsoft had just released, and it had both Photoshop and Expression Blend uh, files, and you know, this, this template has pretty much everything you need to construct a Windows Phone app. And it really helped me rethink how I was going to structure the UI. The most, influ the most influential part of this template was this really nice uh, panorama. And the second I saw it, I just immediately wanted to start playing around with it and playing with different ideas. The good thing about the... Um, why is this not working? The good thing about the panorama was it allowed me to actually... Uh, I didn't have to change a lot of the underlying design. So I'd bubble up information to the panorama. But once the user drilled down, it was the, the app that they had already known and the, the app that they were already very familiar with. And so they, were, they went from the panorama to the pivot control, and it was this kind of win-win. And sticking with the desire to innovate and pay attention to the finer details, I, I made some drastic changes to, this, uh, the, to the playback um, UI and the playback controls. I drew a bit of inspiration from the uh, OS dial pad, and I, I set up these really big buttons, and I put them in this kind of interesting layout and I thought you know that was pretty cool at the time and you know I was quite happy with the direction that the UI was going and I felt between the uh, the new panorama and the and the player control we had enough to justify this 3.0 launch that I that I've been talking about coming back to the importance of uh, customer support Mike received an email from a guy called Ron Manlapaz and he was having some issues subscribing to an author or something like that and it turns out that Ron was a senior UX designer on the Windows Phone design team and Mike very cleverly asked if Ron would be interested in giving us a bit of feedback on, on our latest designs. And sure enough, Ron being the cool cat that he is, he was more than happy and we started this exchange. You know, not only did he come back with amazing feedback, but he actually CC'd his manager, uh, Brian Agneta, into the conversation. And so here I was, getting feedback from literally the best in the business. And um, I had to pinch myself a few times, um, and it was, it was awesome. And here's, here's some of the conversations that we had. My beloved video player got ripped to shreds. Um, <laughs> the gradients uh, and the bevels that I'd used in the, um, uh, in, in the slider controls, they broke the Metro design language. And by doing this, I was giving visual priority to controls that weren't, you know, the, the sliders weren't more important than play and pause. But if you, if, you, if you look, the first things that pop out at you on that screen are those two sliders because of the way that I was using this gradients and trying to make it look real as opposed to Metro. Ron also felt that the UI was a big risk. I aligned the primary playback controls on the left and um, you know this is fantastic if you're actually holding the, the phone with your left hand but you know what happens when you hold it with your right and so the UI completely broke down in that case. Uh, next was the volume slider itself and um, you know we would had a custom volume slider inside our app for a very long time and it was actually a big hit with our users and so you can imagine I was quite surprised when Brian told me that he'd like to see it completely canned and um, what followed was was a very interesting conversation on one hand you know we actually had proof that this feature was something our users wanted uh, people found their hardware buttons tedious sometimes and um, some, some people would watch YouTube before going to bed and they'd have, have it on low volume but they'd forget to put it back on a high volume so their alarms wouldn't wake them up in the morning and the thing is this, this um, UI slider helped them get around that and so you know I was a little confused why does he want us to remove it and the thing is this this issue falls under Microsoft's winners one design principle and basically by us providing a control that isn't found anywhere else in the system we're kind of backstabbing everyone and priming our user for a bad overall experience. And so to further elaborate, and despite the fact that our users are going to be happy with their YouTube experience, what happens when they go into their media player or uh, another music app that's actually adhering to this principle? You know, they're going to get a taste of what our experience is like, and you know, it might actually be better, but when they jump into these other apps, they're going to be left wanting, and so overall, the experience is bad. And it's a tough concept, and you know, there's, there's a lot of exceptions here, but and the point is we should try and work within the system constraints and give users a consistent overall experience. So here's the uh, design I actually ended up settling on. There's, as you can see, there's no more gradients, there's no more bevels, uh, no, no volume slider. 
And the primary control is placed correctly in the middle where it's accessible from, from everywhere and it's the largest uh, visual on the screen. And so we were still able to deliver a custom player which you know, has the extra features that are vital to the YouTube experience, but it didn't stray too far from what you'd expect to see uh, throughout the OS. And the next major issue was my rating slider. So another control that I was so proud of. The, the problem was I broke some major fundamentals and it suffered from the same gradient and bevel issues that we discussed. Uh, but more importantly, I placed a vertically sliding uh, control inside a, a page that actually vertically scrolled. And so the action of rating and scrolling were, were competing for the same gesture. And um, it's something that should always be avoided in, in their apps. Another example of this is in, in, in my settings screens. And so you notice the tile notifications slider toggle. It's very easy for somebody wanting to turn off tile notifications via a slide gesture to actually miss that slide control and navigate to the next section and or vice versa. And so um, this, is, this is the kind of things that we should, and a better control in this case would have been a, um, a toggle button or a checkbox. So this is how the design ended up. I replaced the rating slider with two simple toggle buttons. And by removing the slider, I was also able to double the size of the preview player, which ended up making a much nicer experience. So my overzealous desire to innovate without actually considering the fundamentals is kind of what got me into hot water. So I was on the right track, but not quite. And Brian later came back with some really good points about the panorama. And he suggested that the, the panorama is, about, is not about efficiency. And so you know, the, the pivot control is where you want to be efficient. The panorama is quite the opposite. It should be just like a magazine cover. And so you should tease the user to explore and just nibble on bits of information. Uh, it should act as you know, just a suggestive entry point into the different parts of your app. And it should be just like you know, the tip of the iceberg. So I was, I was treating the panorama just like a pivot. I had way too much information and you know, the UI just felt cramped and um, Brian uh, suggested that I strip it back and, and let it breathe. So here's the after and what I did is I, I merged the most viewed and featured into a single double spanning section and I reduced heavily how many videos were displayed. I completely canned the category visuals and so now the categories became just a simple text list and each section of the panorama I laid out differently and I alternated from a high visual to a low visual, back to a high visual so you can see it goes from, from pictures to text to pictures to text and this kind of just eases, through, uh, eases the user through the browsing experience. And the key thing with panoramas is you should uh, make very clear suggestions and not try to do too much with it. Brian also pinged me on the fact that I was making up font sizes as I went on. Um, and I didn't, correctly uh, I didn't correctly align to the design grid. And so we had to go through all our templates again and, and, and see and what the correct sizes were and realign everything. And this was very, very tedious. But the end result meant that the, 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 the app looked a lot more native to the OS. And had I actually done this from the very beginning, I wouldn't have had any issues at all. And finally, uh, Brian wanted me to redesign my, UI, uh, my login UI to mimic the system default. Now, there wasn't anything like, particularly wrong with my initial design, but uh, he wanted to highlight this idea of having a consistent overall experience. And um, we took this on board, and every custom control from there that we actually built, we managed to, or we, we tried to mimic something that was already on the OS. And this is another thing that, you know, doing these things, Windows Phone and, and, and Metro Design in general is, is not about reinventing the wheel. It's all about a consistent unified experience throughout the, the whole, the whole um, OS. So with the uh, 3.0 nearly out of beta, my attention shifted from the app experience to getting the app ready for launch. And up until this point, you know, our apps were heavily tied to our company brand. And as I suggested earlier, you know, our primary goal was to make a name for ourselves and you know, get as much exposure as possible. And the thing is, you know, our branding was very much hit and miss. I think half of the room probably says, oh, that's kind of cool, and half of the room says, well, you guys are crazy. What the hell, you got a worm on a freaking page? You know, it's, and so you know, it, was, it was very much hit and miss. And they either, they either loved the worm or they despised it. They either you know, liked the lighthearted, joking approach or they refused to take us seriously. 
And you know, our website was was also nothing you know, nothing to do with Metro, anything but actually. And you know, we had this cartoon theme going on, and it was all it was all just a bit confusing. And I knew that you know, trying to promote a product that was as clean and as refined as 3.0 via the current website uh, under the name LazyTube, it, it wasn't going to do it justice. So what followed um, was going to be a complete pain in the bum, but I decided to make some drastic changes. I completely redesigned our company so that it fell in line with the Metro Design language. And you know, we were stuck with our company name, and I wasn't about to change it, but I decided that I, w I would take no risks and I would separate our company branding from the application experiences themselves. And so what I mean by this is every single app from now on would get its own website, it would get its own uh, social media outlets, it would get its own, um, and it would fall under its own unique, unified look. So rather than us trying to shove our branding onto people, we would let people fall in love with our app and then let them seek out who is behind it. So you know, this was a, a quite a different strategy, that, that uh, quite a different marketing strategy for us. And um, so what I did is I, I canned all the um, anything related to cartoons. I stripped back the company logo branding, and uh, the new logo ended up becoming a tile, a, a worm passing through a tile, which also spelled out the words LWA, which is an acronym for Lazy Worm Apps. And um, the thing, early iterations we showed to our customers, we were still receiving mixed feedback. And now it was the flip side. We had uh, a lot of people that liked it, and a lot of people that were saying we completely lost the personality that they'd grown to love. And so uh, there was actually one comment that, that, that someone made a suggestion that it looked like a tapeworm. And so I thought, well, you know, this is, this is, not, the, this is not the kind of image that, that we want to be giving across. And so I thought, OK, if, we, if, if we're going to be a worm, what kind of worm should we be? And you know, it hit me, gummy worms, right? So you can't go wrong with gummy worms. And um, that's why I started playing around with much more uh, brighter colors, and it really helped me tone down the seriousness of our branding. The concept of the gummy worm also helped me with the website copy, and the idea of us building sweet apps uh, would now become our motto. So we actually continued taking a light-hearted approach but rather than trying to do this visually with cartoons, uh, we did it with color and we did it with wording on our website. And so you know, this helped us retain our personality and the image that we're trying to portray, but it still fell in line with the Metro design language. A lazy tube was rebranded to Metro Tube, and now it sported a clean, simple logo. Uh, the website and social media images, um, you know, the, the, it followed suit, and we had uh, this complete unified experience. And now all the pieces of the puzzle were complete and we launched MetroTube in late uh, 2011 and it was a, uh, an overnight success and I should probably be a little bit more humble but we smashed it out of the park. It, was, uh, it rocked and it ended up making uh, quite a splash. Ever since the announcement of Consumer Preview, uh, the opportunities of Windows 8 would really um, start to hit home with me. And now that we'd achieved a decent amount of exposure on Windows Phone, uh, it was time to prepare for the launch of, of Windows 8. And getting our app approved uh, wasn't easy. The marketplace um, was strictly invite only, and Microsoft had a set of hurdles in place um, to ensure that any accepted app would be of a showcase standard. So they had this thing called the um, App Excellence Review, and I won't go too much into details, but I think that the general process is hugely beneficial to anybody who wants to deliver a quality Windows, phone, uh, Windows 8 experience. So the first thing we had to do was we had to outline our UX goals. We had to outline our primary uh, use case scenarios, uh, who are we catering for, and essentially explain you know, how our app would deliver an exceptional experience. What was going to make us stand out, and what were we going to do uh, very, very well? Next was the navigation flow. They wanted, a, they wanted a complete overview of every single screen and how users would navigate uh, throughout those screens. So initially I'd uh, tackled this with uh, paper prototypes, a big, big old pin board and a bunch of string. And it helped me really flesh out how I was going to tackle this problem. You'll notice here that also it's split up into uh, the hub, sec hub and then sections and details. That's the general outline of, of what you'd um, base your, your hierarchy around. I couldn't submit that to Microsoft. 
So I had to uh, eventually set up this document, which was a very extremely detailed uh, document outlining exactly what the flow was like. And for the final stages, for the final stages of the review, uh, we had to outline every single screen and how it would adapt to the different uh, Windows 8 views. And so, you know, how would it look like in the snap view? How would it look like in the portrait view, landscape view? What would it look like in a big screen, small screen? Um, what does it look like when you semantically zoom? And all these kind of things. And so they wanted us to flesh out exactly how each of these screens would adapt. And then on the right there, you can see uh, parts of that document that was submitted. And finally, we'd, um, we had to outline all of our start tiles and how uh, they would uh, behave in the live tile state. And we had to outline what, what, what contracts that we were going to support. So basically, before we'd written a single line of code, uh, Microsoft had us flesh out this entire app experience. And this process, you know, it was tedious, it was time consuming, um, and the complete polar opposite of how we actually got started on Windows Phone. But it meant that we were able to deliver a much more refined product within a significantly shorter time frame. And if you remember, uh, MetroTube took us all something like a year and a half to get to, to that point, whereas Twitro, we did it in three months. And I think the design, uh, Twitro is not as polished as MetroTube, but the design is, is, is almost on par. And, you know, it, Having, having thought through the process so heavily at the start really helped us do this and also helps um, cut down on development time. So Twitro has been out in the marketplace for a few months now and the feedback that we've received has been quite eye-opening. Unlike any other project I've worked on uh, before, Windows 8 apps are essentially hybrid apps. They need to be able to work under several different uh, varying use cases. And when I, when I designed Twitter, I had one thing in mind, and that was purely the touch experience. Um, you know, I was told that if I designed for touch, that I'd get mouse and keyboard for free. And this is true for the most part, but I hadn't really properly considered what the, what the desktop experience would be like. And um, what quickly started to hit home was the fact that almost everybody, when we launched, almost everybody was using our app on, on the desktop via big monitors. And so, you know, I was, I was so blinded by my techie mentality and I forgot that I was the only one, well, some, one of the very few people uh, in the world who was using it via, you know, a proper Windows 8 tablet. And I think, you know, even, you know, even with the official launch and the introduction of a lot of these new touch devices that are going to be coming, um, it, a lot of people or the majority of people are going to be upgrading their existing devices and so ignoring the desktop experience isn't, isn't something that, that we can do. So this has pretty much been our focus uh, now, and um, we're in the process of optimizing the desktop experience. And so here's a few things that we've learned so far. You absolutely must have a killer snap view. Now, some of your desktop users, they like the idea of multitasking, and you know, the better, they'll snap it onto the side of their screen, they'll do their work, and so the better that your, your snapped experience is, the more engaging it is, the more functional it is, uh, the more likely they're gonna keep it open. And so it's not, it's not just about you know, changing the layout to, to, to adapt to the snap view. You actually got to think purely about how are they going to interact? How is that experience going to be? How is it going to work in that snap view? Uh, probably one of the most commonly requested features has been keyboard shortcuts. I mean, we, we completely ignored this when we launched. And um, you know, it's something very simple and, and easy to do that, that makes a big difference to the experience. A little more on the advanced uh, user side, but uh, it also pays to try and navigate your app put the mouse aside and try and navigate your app via keyboard. Um, ours doesn't even come close. It doesn't even work at all. But you know, this is something that we really need to fix. Um, because there will be people, as you see uh, Jeff Atwood before, you know, he wants to just tweet just via the keyboard. And um, you know, it's something that needs to be considered. The Windows 8 no compromise experience is it's a very exciting concept. But getting it right with the apps is extremely difficult. Uh, there's so many different factors that you need to consider, and it's something that you know we're still trying to get our heads around today. Um, the take-home message is, you know, just be aware that your apps are going to be used in so many different use cases on so many different devices, and um, it's something that, that really needs to be contemplated. So that's pretty much been uh, our journey to date. Um, I'm genuinely excited about the future. I believe that we're witnessing a, a very interesting time in our industry. 
And for those for those who haven't started building uh, building apps, Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8 are just around the corner. Uh, so you know, there really couldn't be a better time to get started. There's now a wealth of resources available. Uh, it really only takes a matter of weeks to get up to speed. And um, you know, as opposed to trying to learn the ropes like we did over the, the duration of a year and a half. As we saw in yesterday's keynote, I think it's worth noting that we actually have a lot of awesome stuff coming out of New Zealand. And it would be nice to see more and more Kiwis showing the world what we're capable of. On a final note, uh, if you are working on an app or thinking about getting started and want to have a chat, and you know, I'm more than happy and we're more than happy to show our support. So uh, flick, me, uh, flick me an email at lazywomaps.com or tweet me or uh, come and say hi at Ticket. And um, thank you very much and thanks for coming to our session. I know there's a lot of sessions uh, that are on and uh, we really appreciate that you guys uh, chose to come see and I hope you took something away today and I wasn't too boring. <laughs>